So anyhow, anyhow, this major idea that God owns it all, we're the stewards. Every important person in your life, every valuable relationship, every possession that you have belongs to God, and he's made us custodians, caretakers, or as we say, stewards for them, over them. And so it can't be made more clear than in uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, which is kind of the psalm that we're using uh, to, to launch our series. There God says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. That God owns it all, claims ownership of it all, including those who dwell in it. That would be us. Last Sunday after church, you know, I made the big point last week that God owns it all. That that dog that you own is really God's dog, right? And the marriage is really God's marriage. And one of our church members, I won't name names, if your friend was with her on Facebook, you saw it. But later in the day, she told her, I don't know what he is, four years old, son to get his feet off of her couch. And he said, that's not your couch, that's God's couch. And... Uh, <laughs> tagged me in the comments and said, if you had been at church, you'd know where that came from. But this, uh, this series is called Make the Most of Your Life because if we can get hold of this reality and if we can then live it out and live it by God's rules and by his responsibilities for the things that he gives us, it can radically change all the pieces of our lives, which ultimately change, changes our lives. So as a way of summarizing last week, maybe in a different way, but just to kind of set the stage for today, in three phrases, first of all, there is the gift of stewardship. The gift of stewardship, God owns it all, but God gives it to us. He gives blessing to us because he wants us to have them. He wants us to be blessed. He just wants us to treat them like it's his and not ours. Then there's the expectation of stewardship. We looked at that parable of the talents last Sunday from Matthew 25. God expects us to manage what he's put in his possession by his ways, his rules, and for his glory. And there is great blessing in that expectation that God promises his favor and his goodness in our lives. And then there's the accountability of stewardship, that ultimately God holds us accountable uh, even when we have little or even when we had something and now we don't have it anymore, God expects us to take care of everything that he gives us as if he is the owner because he is. And God expects us to protect it and to expand it. We learned, when, a lot of us did when we were kids, that we, when we use something that's not ours, we should leave it better than we found it. But here's our problem when it comes to God's ownership and our stewardship. Generally speaking... Many of us, we want the good things that God wants to give us, but we don't always want to keep God's rules for them. We don't often, many people don't, want to do things God's way. We want the blessings without keeping his rules. And we want the good things without the responsibility that comes with the work to get it. We like to play by our own rules. But there's a problem with that. And that is that the way that God has always dealt with mankind throughout history is through what he calls covenants. That's how God deals with us. And covenants, God's covenants, are these relational agreements that God offers to man. They're like contracts in that, you know, they're, they're, they're a commitment. We've all signed contracts. But they're far bigger than contracts. Covenants are like contracts, but they're very personal. And in God's covenants, what we're doing is we, we come at his invitation into a personal relationship with him, and then within those covenants are covenants between each other, very special relationships with each other. It's like God says, I'm going to offer you the invitation for me to give you, I'm going to give you myself, and I'm going to know you, and I'm going to get, I want to let you know me, and I'm going to look after you, and I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to work in your life and be in your life because my covenant with you is very personal. And God's been offering covenants throughout history. The, 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 one of the first ones was the one that he made with Noah, right? And there's still a sign, we get to see it often, uh, with the rainbow. 
He offered a covenant to people through Abraham. Basically, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your descendants, and through your descendants, I'm going to bless the entire world. He did it again with Moses and the giving of the law. He did it with David when David was king, that that through David's particular lineage, there would come another king who would be the king forever. And of course, that was Jesus. In fact, all of those covenants from the old covenant point to Jesus who fulfilled them and ushered in this new thing that God was doing when Christ came to the earth, and that is bringing this new covenant, this very special relationship with God where essentially God is saying in this relational agreement, meaning that it's very personal, it's between you and me, I will be your God and you will be my people and that relationship will last forever. And and we will also, I'm bringing you into relationships with others. You will belong to me, I'll belong to you, and you will belong to one another. Now, that's kind of a hint at the church. So think of it like this, because I think it helps us to to see it in this way. At his gracious invitation, I enter into covenantal relationships with God. God didn't have to offer me any of these, but he does it because he's good, and he's filled with grace, and he wants to give us what makes our life the best. No one forces their way into a relationship with God. He offers it to me by his gracious invitation. The New Testament says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. But then, but then, coming into this relationship with him comes with responsibility on my part. I can't just enter into this covenantal relationship with God and say, Hey, thanks God for doing what you did. Now I'm just going to live my life doing things my way. Once I'm in, there there are ways, there are rules and responsibilities that the owner and the initiator of the covenant uh, insists that I submit to. And so at his gracious invitation, I enter into these covenantal relationships with God. But then it's in my surrendered willingness that I submit to God's authority as the owner or God's authority as the king or the Lord or as God. God is God. And and because he would love me enough that knowing I don't deserve it would send his son to die in my place to, to pay for my sins, I'm willing to surrender to his authority and do things his way. That is the requirement of stewardship. I want to show you four covenantal relationships that God offers to us. The first one is the covenant of salvation, right? This is the big one. This was the new thing, ultimately, that that Christ was coming to do. But, But here's the deal. This first covenant begins at the individual level. This is directed towards you and you and you and you. It works like that. It's very personal. It's very individualized. This covenant is unique in that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and those who would believe into him, put their faith in him, come into relationship with him, he gives eternal life. And then within that covenant between God and man, he offers these other covenantal relationships that we enter into with him and others, but they have rules The first one would be, or the second one, next one, the first is the covenant of salvation. Then there's the covenant of marriage and family. God calls a marriage a covenant relationship. There are three people in in, in God's design for marriage. There is God first, then the husband, and then the wife. And then thirdly, the third covenant relationship is the covenant of his church. Not only at this gracious invitation do I enter a personal relationship with God when I put my faith in him, but I enter into a corporate relationship with brothers and sisters who, as undeservedly as I did, have received the grace of God and Jesus has saved them. Jesus called this, uh, this group, this, his, he called it his, his body. He named it the ecclesia. We translate it as the church. And then fourthly, 
There's the covenant of our responsibility to the world. Now that we've come into this relationship with God through our salvation in his church, there is a mission. And the mission is to take the good news of the gospel to, to people and to make Christ known. People who, were, who are just like I was before Christ came into my life. And all of these covenants come with the promise of God's blessings. And I mean the potential for big, huge, out-of-this-world blessings. Now, it doesn't mean the absence of problems. And it doesn't mean that we won't struggle from time to time or even suffer from time to time. We, we'll all go through tragedy. But what it does mean is that God's presence and his power is working and his goodness and his favor are present and there is joy in, uh, in our lives no matter what we're dealing with. So you and I, we, generally speaking, not naming anybody, I can name myself, but we generally love God's invitation into these grace covenant relationships because they're good. I rejoice in my salvation. I sing that song a while ago and it's all I can do to stay on my feet. And, and I praise God that I'm, you know, that Christ is in my life and someday I'll, I'll go to heaven. I, I love the benefit and the blessing of, of my marriage relationship and the family that has, that has come from it. So we generally love God's invitation by grace under these covenantal relationships, but a lot of us, we want those blessings and we want those good parts, but we often want to pick and choose which of God's covenant rules we're planning on keeping. We like to make up our own rules. And sometimes it's just blatant. We reject and break God's rules because we, we think that, well, he's a forgiving God, so, you know, I'll do it. I'll just ask for forgiveness. At other times, we want God's blessings, but, but we try to keep the rules from our old life, pre-Christ life, and operate by them in this new relationship with him. Has it ever been true of you that you prayed for the blessing, but you didn't submit to God's rules? You wanted the good stuff that comes with this good thing God has offered to you, but you didn't want to submit to his ownership, to his lordship. I heard an old preacher say one time, what we want is to harvest fruit and berries and nuts, but what we're doing is we're sowing wild oats. And there's a problem with that because just like in your house, if you live in God's house, but you don't want to play by God's rules, you and the owner are not going to get alone. So I want to look at a place in Scripture. If you want to look along with me, it'll be on the screen or in your Bible or on your app. Psalm 128. And, and this is a place in the Scripture where God puts all of these covenantal relationships together and working together and, and shows us how when they're done God's way, there's a great blessing. And just before we look at it, I, I want to say two things about it. First of all, notice the number of times the word bless or blessed show up in this passage. Because this is the ultimate outcome, God's blessing. And I'm going to define that in just a moment. And then I want to encourage you parents and, and grandparents too. But especially parents and you got young kids and I remember being there, it was, seems like such a long time ago, you should just, I want to encourage you to just hang out in this, these six verses for a month. Just read it, meditate on it, think on it, pray that this describe, could describe your life, your, your, your marriage, your family life. It's, it's really, really good. So Psalm 128, I want to read through it first. There's only six verses, and then I want to go back and unpack it. So Psalm 128, verse 1 says this, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall a man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May 
you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And then it ends with a blessing. And may you see your grandchildren, your children's children, peace upon Israel. Did you notice the number of times, about four times, the word bless or bless showed up in that passage? So when you're talking about God's blessing, having God's blessing in your life, we use that word a lot. We say, I'm blessed, or you know, God bless you, or God is blessing me. What do we mean when we say that we're blessed? Better yet, what does God mean when he says you're blessed? What is God talking about when he says, that's a blessed man, that's a blessed woman? So God's blessing is really a, a bundle of good things that God gives. Here's, here's what they are. First of all, it's God's presence, right? The blessing of God means God is in this. God is here. He is in it, he's here, he's there in it. It also means, in addition to his presence, it means his power. God's blessing means that God is working in it, in you. That he is doing things and accomplishing things. He's moving and working. It means his goodness, thirdly, his goodness and favor. That, uh, that God sees that there is good in your life. Again, it doesn't mean that there's not struggle, that there's not bad times. But God is blessing you with his favor, with his goodness. And then it means his happiness, his joy. Because ultimately, having that peace with God and having an inner sense of satisfaction is what leads to happiness and joy. That's the blessing of God. So again, in verse 1, he says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So again... God begins with you, the individual, the personal. This is kind of that covenantal salvation thing. Everyone who fears the Lord can have this relationship with God. So your responsibility and mine, our requirement, is to fear the Lord. I back up from that statement for just a moment and ask the question, what does it really mean to fear the Lord? I've taught on this before. It's been a while back. Um, it's one of those topics that when people talk about it or preachers try to explain it, they're worried because they don't want to go too far. They don't want you to think that fearing God is, is like the same kind of fear you'd have for a brutal dictator or an evil uh, person or someone who seeks to do harm. I've heard, I've heard preachers try to explain it as, well, think reverence. Think reverence for God. That's true. The only problem with thinking reverence is, I know people who live the most godless, sin-filled lives that if they were to walk into a church building, they'd take their hat off in reverence to God, right? That's not reverence. That's just what your mama taught you. Let me give you a definition for the fear of God that I think it's the best one I've ever got. And, and, and it is, you know, I, I hang with it. Here, here it is. The fear of the Lord is that you take God seriously and you don't mess with him. You take God seriously, and you don't mess with him. I'm going to tell you, God is good, but God is God. He's not someone to mess with. Now, that definition, you take God seriously, and you don't mess around with him, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't sound real proper. Maybe that's not the way your Sunday school quarterly tried to, to, to deal with it. But I promise you, that statement is deeply theological. You take God seriously as opposed to taking God for granted. Seriously as opposed to taking him casually. You can't pick and choose which of God's rules you're going to keep and, 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 and think that you're taking him seriously. And reality is that we live in a, an American Christianized culture, especially here in the South, that takes God casually and takes God for granted. Tony Evans has a great book. I'd recommend that you read it. Uh, it's called uh, Kingdom Stewardship. And he says on this topic that, that what we live in in our culture is a culture where God is good for the invocation and God is good for the benediction as long as God stays out of all the things in between. And that's the kind of culture that we live in. But God says, my blessing in your life, my favor and goodness in your life is directly tied to, to the fear of me that I demand of you, that you take me seriously. 
So how can you know whether you fear God or not? Well, he says, those who fear the Lord, are they're walking in his ways. Not just talking in his ways, but actually walking in his ways. And then the reward of fearing him, verse 2, you will eat the fruit of your labor, uh, of your hands, and you will be blessed, and it will be well with you. This is when God joins you in your life because you're following him. He joins you in your marriage, in your family. He joins you in your work and career. He joins you in your planning and your giving and your spending and your saving. And, and, and isn't that ultimately what we want? God's blessing and his presence in our lives. And he says, it will be well with you. That's both present and future. That's God's promise that he's way out ahead of you arranging things that you could never know are in your future. And when you get there, God will be there. It will be well with you. But the catalyst for all of it is your personal devotion and your willingness to surrender to him and submit to him to follow his rules and do things his way. I don't really know of a self-test that anyone can take to determine if they're truly walking in the ways of God. But here's what you can do. If you possess the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who comes in when you receive the new life that's in Christ, you know. You just know. We know if we're truly moving towards him, if I'm surrendering to him, you just know. Then look again at verse 3. The psalmist moves from the next level or to the next level of God's ownership and stewardship, the family. He says, this great picture, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots, olive plants around your table. I'm going to tell you something, men. You should really pay attention to this. This is a good memory verse for us. Originally, this was written to men. It's a much different culture now, uh, the new culture we learned from, from Jesus. But what God is saying here is that marriage is a covenant relationship, and they are, there are three people in that covenant. It is a legitimate love triangle. God is first, then there's the husband, then there's the wife. There's the initiator and the inviter and the blesser, and he invites the man and the woman into this covenant relationship with himself and with each other. Then... In most marriages, not all, but many marriages, children are born or children are adopted. And the marriage covenant extends to include the family. God invented the family too. Two series from now, in May, we're going to do a series that we're going to title God's Blueprint for the Home. And here's why we would do a series like that. And here's why I'm calling such attention to it and emphasizing this covenant of marriage and family. It is because marriage and family are under assault in our culture like no other thing. We are a culture that is actively creating our own definitions and rules for marriage and family, and people are suffering as the result. And the outside pressure for every single one of us, the outside pressure to to buy that or to adopt that or to bring bits and pieces of that in, it is on you. It is on us. And it is a legitimate battle. And it's like every day as a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or a grandparent or as a kid in the home, you've got to decide, you've got to decide, are you going to do this God's way or are you going to do it my way. Marriage is not a human creation. God created marriage. A a family is not a man-made creation. God created marriage. It was dreamed up in his imagination, and you nor anyone else can make their own rules and have God's blessing in their lives. Last week, I said that uh, God owns your dog, A little kid said that God owns your couch. God owns your spouse, too. She's not yours. She's his. He's not yours. He's his. The kid's the same. It's the blessing of God in our lives. So it's critically important 
that, that, that we don't try to be married as Christians, but operate our marriage with this culture's rules. And listen, church, God does not change his standards because everybody else is doing it. God doesn't change his standards when the Supreme Court or the, or the Congress or anyone rules on anything. Just because somebody created, created their own definition of marriage or their own way to do marriage or their own rules for it does not mean that God is okay with it. Marriage belongs to God. And the responsibility of the stewardship begins, he says, with the husband. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in your house. I brought up my dog last week. I did the dumbest thing, and it happens to me every so often. I, I, uh, I spoke to my dog yesterday, and, and Lori was in another room and thought I was speaking to her. And I said, I said, hey, baby, are you getting hungry? And from the other room, Lori said, yeah, I'm kind of getting hungry. And, and, instead of, and instead of saying, oh, great, then let me, you know, let's get some food, and I'll feed the dog while I'm at it. I said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the dog. Uh, I'm like, oh. And, uh, and so yesterday I just took the opportunity to say, hey, do you realize that God says you're like a fruitful vine in this home? Right after I did it. And she was like, you need to go and do what you were doing. But, but this is the deal. Actually, she said something different. But it's a little, yeah, a little edgy. I thought I might not do it. But here's the deal. The husband is the steward of his family to oversee and to lead his family that belongs to God. In, in fact, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, it says that a husband is to honor and to protect his wife in the same way that he does the most precious piece of china in the china cabinet. That's God's plan. Do you, as a husband, take him seriously on that? And men, it's worth the occasional conversation with your wife, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, and preaching to myself, right? To, to just say, hey, God says that my responsibility is that you're like a fruitful vine. That means you feel fulfilled and productive and whole. How am I doing? What can I change? What can we do differently? Then he moves to that picture of the wife. The picture of her as a fruitful vine is one of productivity. She's to love and honor the one who's loving and leading her. And she's to nurture her children along with the support of her husband. It's not easy to do that. But there are two people who are solely committed to one another and God is in the middle of it. Two people who in hard times have each other, but together they also have God, who if they're doing things his way, is present in there and is powerful in there and is working in there and is bringing happiness and joy. And husband, your wife needs to, to know without any doubt or questions. She, she needs to feel your love and your honor and your care and your protection. And wife, it's the same. Your husband needs to feel it and know your love, your honor, your nurture of the children. In fact, if you want to give a great Valentine's Day to your gift, Love one another the way that God says to do it the other 364 days of the year. It makes this one special. He refers to the, to, to the children as olive shoots. Those are plants, not trees. They're, they're, they're being cultivated to grow as trees. When they're shoots, they're pliable. They're, they're attempting to grow deep roots. Someday they'll produce olives. It takes about 16 years to go from olive sapling to olive tree that produces fruit. But the beauty of God choosing this illustration is that, we're, we're, that once they begin to produce fruit, olive trees can produce fruit for generation after generation after generation. This is the beauty of passing along the knowledge and the covenant of God into future generations. We're told in Israel that some of those olive trees are nearly 2,000 years old. But the picture is God owns it, gives it to us, and says, I invite a lot of blessing into your life if you will do this my way. And then, verse 4, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. In this, thus, in this way, in God's way, in God's covenant, with God's rules in place, 
you will be blessed. You know what it means, I guess, in a, in a real practical way? It means that you can't give him the cold shoulder for the next couple of days because you're not feeling it. It means that you can't mistreat her because you want to get her back for what she did. What it means is you love her, you love him, the way that God loves you when you're not feeling it and when you are not honoring him or doing things right. It means that you can't get a divorce just because you're not happy. That is the world's rules. That's not God's rules. What God has given you in terms of your marriage, you fight like you fight for it. You fight for your marriage. It means that you can't go and have a relationship with another person because you're not getting enough of what you think you deserve more of at home. That's the world's rules. That's not God's rules. God says this is not about you and your whims. In fact, marriage wasn't designed for you to get what you need so that you could be happy. Marriage is designed for you to glorify God. Marriage is designed as the perfect laboratory to learn to love somebody the way that God loves you. Somebody who's ornery at times, somebody who's not carrying their load at times, somebody who just really ticks you off at times the same way that you do God. That's what God looks for in your marriage. And God says, let me tell you how to be happy. You fear me. You take me seriously and don't mess with, with me. And I will make you happy. And come on, church. You know the greatest social crisis and the greatest threat to the national security of the United States is the breakdown of the family. It is not those things that the nightly news or Twitter or whomever you get your stuff from. It's not what they tell you it is. All of those things are caused by the one thing that is killing us more than anything else. People trying to do marriage and have families and doing it by their own rules and not God's. And the breakdown of the home is the leading cause of poverty, racial disparities, crime, emotional disorders, higher taxes, higher imprisonment, and about two dozen other ailments. And frankly, what we, what we have in large numbers are rootless parents who are making rootless kids who grow up and can't produce fruit, and they produce more chaos and more brokenness. Young men who don't know how to cultivate a vine in his home that is fruitful. Young women who don't know how to be a fruitful vine that can be cultivated. There's no chance for their children to be like olive plants. And, and, and if you subscribe to that, like I do, you can call me old-fashioned, but the old and old-fashioned in this topic, this subject that God created, goes all the way back to him, and he's been around for a long time. And we can keep dumbing down the rules. We can throw all the money at it that we want to, but until people start taking God seriously, it will not change. It will only get worse, and it keeps getting worser and worser by the year. And maybe we can't expect an unbelieving world to do things God's way, but we can sure start in our own homes. Amen? My marriage, my family. Do you take God seriously? And if you're a young person getting ready to make your life choices about relationships, so are you taking God seriously? Then, this third area of God's stewardship, the covenant of his church. Verse 5, he says, The Lord bless you from Zion. And from the Old Covenant that we read about in the Old Testament, Zion designated God's holy dwelling place. It was the place that his covenant people gathered to worship him, to sacrifice to him, to serve him. Zion was the Old Covenant picture that pointed to something better that was coming, which is what Jesus would bring in, and that is the church. God doesn't manifest himself in a place anymore. There are no buildings where God lives. There are no buildings that are literally the house of God. God now comes to live in us who receive the new life that's in Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. And when he comes in, 
He brings us into this new gathering, the body of Christ, or as Jesus called it, the church. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 where the writer is setting up uh, to talk about the church. And he says, he essentially says, he goes back to when Moses was on Mount Sinai dealing with God and gets the law from God. And in this, you know, he's pleading with God and he's, he's full of fear because he's in the presence of God. But it's not that way anymore in the church because of what Jesus has done. So the writer in Hebrews 12, picking up in verse 22, says, No, you have come to Mount Zion. Again, this is New Testament, not Old Testament. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children. That's you, whose names are written in heaven. That's you. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who've been made perfect now. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates this new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. It's just the writer, he, he chooses to go back to, to when Cain killed Abel. Uh, it, it was one man exacting his revenge and his hatred against his brother. But when Jesus was murdered, it was done out of the will of God for God's love in order to bring us forgiveness of sin. And then note this last thought that he has, verse 25. He says, so be careful that you don't refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. That's not a casual relationship. It's a blood covenant to be a part of the church. Church membership, commitment of myself and my family to, a, to the local body where God leads me is a covenant relationship with God and with one another. You and I to God, you and I to each other. That's why there's about 70 one another's in the New Testament. And of course, you would think that the way you treat your children would matter to God or the way that you treat your spouse but the way that we treat his church is equally important to God. His responsibility for Christians is that we take the body of Christ, the church, seriously. It is not a casual relationship. It's a serious relationship. And when we do it God's ways, with God, God's rules, he blesses his church and he blesses our impact in it. And then this picks up verse 5. He says, may you, this final level of stewardship, may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life, and may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So you follow him here. He goes from the individual to the family, to the, to the body, to, to the body of God's people, the church, and then to the city and to the nation. And again, one doesn't have to be overly perceptive to to, to see that we're a nation in a lot of turmoil and a lot of trouble on just about every front. And the cause is, when you exclude God from just about everything, you lose God's blessing. When you put God in the invo invo invocation and the benediction, but you leave him out in all the things that are in between, it doesn't matter who you elect as the president or send to Congress or, or the Senate. Because the farther down your priority list that a person or a family or a church or a nation, the farther down the list of priorities you move God, the less involved he is in your affairs. It was the responsibility of Zion to be the place where God was worshipped, where his word was taught, where God spoke, so that then the standards of God could go back out with the people into the larger culture, and it is the same for the church. The church is not solely responsible for the fall of our culture, but we have a really big role on it, in it. A lot of us, maybe not now, maybe it is now, but a lot of Christians have dumbed down God's standards in their own lives, and it's helped lower the standards out there. But it is the stewardship of every Christian to be a, de a devoted genuine disciple of Christ and to bring their values 
and their witness into the public square and to go public with their faith. This is not a day for undercover Christians. That's just an indication that we're scared of the consequences of following Jesus and we don't trust God. Jesus said this about us in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Matthew 5, 14, you're the light of the world. You're a city that's set on a hillside. That can't be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put a, lot, they put a lit thing on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. And in doing so, glorify your Father in heaven. Do you take God seriously about being a witness for him in, the, in public? What I know about you, because we're basically all the same, is that when it comes to our one-on-one -on -one relationships with God, and when it comes to things as important as marriage and family, there's nothing more important to us. And when it comes to your relationship and your commitment to Christ and, 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 and his church and this responsibility that we have to make him known, we all want the blessing. We want his presence and his power and his goodness and favor and the happiness and the joy. But the blessing comes with doing it God's way. His rules, our responsibility, and no other way will work. So I want to pray for you this morning that you, that we, will surrender to God's authority in response to his gracious invitation into these wonderful covenant relationships that he's offered to us. Let's bow for prayer. Just before I pray, let me say this. If you're not where you need to be in your relationship with God, or if you haven't come personally into this, not institutionally, but personally into this relationship with God, God offers this amazing grace-filled step that you can take. It's called repentance. It says, when, I, when the pastor says, I know, and I know, so I'm going to stop, and I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to move in your direction, Lord. I'm going to start doing it your way. And I realize, for some of you, that might be a major step. But whatever you fear it will cost you now will be better than having Christ hold you accountable for it someday when you stand before it. Plus, the blessing of God will be yours if you do it His way. So, you know, right now in your heart, we all know. So for some of you, he invites you to come to him for salvation. For others, he's inviting you to return to him in repentance. That marriage, you fight for it. That family, you do the same. That church, it's a commitment. That witness, it is for the one who died for you. Let the world know that in my life, my home, my church, Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, thank you that you would love us and give us blessing. It's at your gracious invitation we're invited into this. Nothing we've done, nothing we've earned. You don't look around and see who's doing it right or who has the potential to do it right and invite us. You find us in our worst condition. You find us in our greatest ignorance. You find us in total rebellion. You find us sinning in ways that, would, that are just awful. And you say, follow me. I want you. The cross was about you. It's the whole reason I came. So do that in someone's life this morning. We all know. We all know. And so may we be honest with ourselves this morning and with you and make decisions that we need to make. In Jesus' name I pray.